Ted Bundy is one of the most infamous serial killers in American history. He viciously assaulted and killed dozens of women in the 60s and 70s. And at the time of his execution, he had confessed to 30 murders. Bundy's murder trial was the first nationally televised trial. It was the first time serial murder and serial rape was made into live entertainment. The audience now had a front row seat inside the courtroom, and they couldn't get enough. The press, contrary to section 78204, Florida statute. I'll plead not guilty right now. And your grand you can trace a line from that to O.J. Simpson's trial, where the 24-hour news cycle was now kicking in, and you can trace that line to today, where there's just been this obsession with true crime. Serial killers are, are, in many ways, a uniquely American phenomenon. That's Joe Berlinger. He's often known as the godfather of true crime. We have 5% of the world's population, and we have had 67% of the world's documented serial killers. The term serial killer is often credited to an FBI investigator named Robert Ressler. Ressler profiled some of the most violent offenders, like John Wayne Gacy, Jeffrey Dahmer, and Ted Bundy. The official definition of serial killers is someone who kills uh, three or more times spaced out, so not all at once, that would be a mass killing. The stereotypical serial killer is usually a middle-aged white man, very ordinary. We're fascinated by the idea of an ordinary person capable of extraordinary evil. And historically, society has defined this archetype as a white, middle-aged man. But data shows that serial killers come from all backgrounds and the numbers are roughly consistent with demographics across the United States. Humans have been telling cautionary tales for millennia. We are wired to look for danger since the earliest days of our hunter-gatherer brains. That instinct to want to look at something terrible so that you're safe from it is still part of our, our biology. This primal instinct may also drive the more contemporary fascination with true crime. It first became popular in the early 20th century. In 1924, Edmund Pearson published this book of essays. One of them described the case of Lizzie Borden, who was accused of killing her father and stepmother with an ax. In the past few decades, media platforms have diversified, making true crime accessible to millions. Take podcasts, for example. In 2014, Serial's breakout popularity carried the genre to new heights. There definitely ha seems to have been a lot more shows and movies um, in recent months and years about these same killers from the 70s, from the 80s. And so as the stories get told over and over again, they almost become like modern folk tales or Americana. Now, 40 years after Ted Bundy's execution, Joe Berlinger brought the serial killer's story back into the public eye with the Ted Bundy tapes. Because he was white, male, and good-looking in a very patriarchal society, people cut him a pass. You're a bright young man. You made a good lawyer. I'd love to have you practice in front of me, but you went another way, partner. Take care of yourself. I don't have any animosity to you. I want you to know that. A guy who is in a position of trust is not somebody who you should necessarily trust. That's the lesson of Bundy. And fans obsessively share these lessons and theories on social media. Christopher Duet is one such fan. He's the host of the podcast Criminal Perspective and something of a self-taught expert on the serial killer psyche. When he was five years old, Bundy's execution was all over the news. I saw a lot of coverage of it and I was very interested by it because I wanted to know why people were rooting for somebody to die. Christopher spent a lot of time corresponding with murderers in his 20s. Over the years, he became pen pals with nearly 50 convicted criminals. I think people's immediate reaction to somebody who goes out of their way to seek out a conversation with a, a deviant criminal is that there's something wrong with us. And that's not always the case. Some people want to learn the, the finer details of investigation and forensics and things like that. Some people just want to watch the cases and the stories and see how they unfold. But why does such a dark subject have an enduring grip on the American public? I think our fascination with serial killers is not an admiration, 
but a looking into the mirror of who are we as a people that we would produce this kind of phenomenon. People are looking for that why. They want to find a reason why people would do these things, how they could do these things. And I think the hope is that they could find something that makes them different than ordinary people. In particular, women are more likely than men to be interested in true crime. The woman is in a coma at Southern Regional Medical Center. The gunman is out there somewhere on the run. One theory is that they have a vested interest in studying it. Women tend to be more aware than men of the danger that they are in a lot of the time or, you know, the fact that terrible things often do befall them and, you know, maybe trying to prepare for that a little bit by just exposing themselves to it in a safe way. Society's fascination with serial killers shows no signs of abating. And this golden age of true crime storytelling only feeds our appetites. True crime is kind of edge of your seat, what's happening next and it's particularly suited for binging and for watching as much as you want at a given time. There aren't a lot of morally clear situations in real life where you can have a clear villain and a clear hero and it, this really works for that. But don't forget the true part of true crime. They are just humans, they are just real people who did very terrible things and a lot of the times we don't hear about the victims. They suffered as a result of this person's actions. And I think, you know, we do some damage when we don't acknowledge that.